All righty, we are live. Hi, everyone, and welcome to our Future by Design webinar series, where today I am talking about the future of coral with Dean Miller. A Future by Design, the webinars are really about creating a vision for what we want the world to look like in the next 20 years. Imagine waking up in the year 2041. What do you see and what do you want to see? Our guest today, Dean Miller, is a scientist, multimedia professional, international television presenter, Australian Geographic sponsored explorer, creator and lead scientist of the world's only living coral biobank project and a highly respected voice and conservationist for all things Great Barrier Reef. And I'm not going to read your very impressive long bio, Dean, because we've put it up on the, uh, the page for this and I'm really excited to talk to you. Um, about the future of coral. Welcome. Good morning and thank you very much, Lisa. Very happy to be here. And hello, everybody out there in internet land. Yes, and thank you everyone who's joining us. We were running a little bit late this morning for technology issues, uh, but we got there. So uh, thanks for your patience, everyone. So Dean, I wanted to kick this off with a background story around when you first witnessed, experienced coral? Yeah, great question. Um, well, I grew up in the western suburbs of Melbourne, so accessing coral wasn't very easy. Um, so probably like most people my age, I first experienced coral through Sir David Attenborough and other like uh, documentaries. And it wasn't really until I was 16 that I got up to the Great Barrier Reef, which was always kind of the, the goal of, you know, the, the career milestones. I always wanted to be a marine biologist, always wanted to work on coral reefs, but had never seen one until I was 16. And uh, I remember getting underwater up here in uh, Cairns uh, on the Great Barrier Reef and just being immersed in the most magical I guess, uh, landscape full of, you know, the most beautiful fish and corals. And there was so much color and life and vibrancy. And it, it really did live up to everything that I had seen in, in documentaries and books. And I don't think I can say that about many places that you have such strong ambitions to see, but uh, it really did. It is one of the most beautiful places, I think, on earth, a coral reef. Um, and I just remember just being blown away and overwhelmed by the the great diversity of life down there. Um, and I think the corals back then were really just beautiful, colorful backdrop to the, the myriad of fish and, and sharks and rays and, and all kinds of things that took my interest. So um, yeah, it wasn't until I was 16. And actually I thought of a question that I haven't asked you before. When did you actually move up to the Great Barrier Reef? Yeah, uh, it wasn't until I was 21. So I did my undergraduate down at Deakin Geelong uh, as a biologist down there and then transferred up to James Cook University uh, to do my honours and then my PhD uh, in marine science. It's very cool and uh, very jealous of the, the, the place that you live. I know it's such a beautiful place to visit for all of us in Australia. It's definitely, I know, on the bucket list for many, many people to go and visit. We've spoken recently around uh, coral bleaching and, and what's happening and future generations actually going and having that experience and seeing coral. What can you share with us of the, what's happened over the last five to 10 years and some of the fears you have about the coral reef? Sure. Um, Pre-2016, we were working on issues surrounding the Great Barrier Reef, like overfishing, uh, crown of thorn starfish, water quality, uh, things like that, things that seemed fairly manageable and, and you know, within our grasp of, of making a difference of. However, uh, since 2016, we've had three mass bleaching events, uh, and that's where the water temperature has been warmer than normal. Um, and what has happened there is that the corals can't get up and move away to colder water or go deeper. And so they are literally bathed in this warm water. And if they're uh, immersed in that for too long, uh, they go through a process of coral bleaching, which is where they actually expel their uh, symbiotic algae partners. So coral is an animal, it's got algae within its tissue. So if it was me, it would be like leaves in my skin and I could sit here in the sun all day and just get my 90% uh, of my food source. Sugar's just delivered to me through photosynthesis. Um, when the water temperature is too high, the corals get rid of all that algae uh, and they lose their color and their food source. And that's what coral bleaching is. It's really just the translucent skin or the, the tissue of the coral. Uh, and you can see through to the, the white coral skeleton underneath. 
um, if the water stays too warm for too long, you end up with coral mortality. And that's what we really saw in 2016, 2017, back to back mass bleaching events. Uh, and then in 1920, we saw another bleaching event that went the entire length of the Great Barrier Reef. And I guess, you know, as a scientist, as a conservationist, as a reef lover, you had in this uh, vision of the Great Barrier Reef that it was too big to fail. You know, it is the largest reef system on the planet. Um, but what those those mass bleaching events told us was that it is not too big to fail. Uh, when that warm water comes, the corals cannot go anywhere. And so we are now really concerned about the future of the Great Barrier Reef and what it means uh, as we continue to go through a warming climate. We are not going to stop the, the climate from warming in the next 5, 10, 15, 20 years. Uh, so we're locked into this. Um, what that means for the Great Barrier Reef is you know, fairly certain to a degree. However, we do have certain intervention measures that we can start implementing to try to improve the health and the resilience. And one of the things you shared with me uh, recently was around how many species of coral there actually are in the reef and how many you've already collected. I read in your, uh, your bio, you've actually been on over 300 expeditions. So I'd love to talk a little bit around the number of species and collecting them and what that's like. Yeah, uh, so there are about 400 or so coral species on the Great Barrier Reef. However, that's up for uh, contention at the moment. And that's because we have new uh, genetic technology that allows us to actually look at what a species is. Um, around the world, there's estimated to be about 800 to 1000 species. So if we look at the Great Barrier Reef, we can assume that we have half of all biodiversity of corals here on the Great Barrier Reef with the rest uh, around the world, particularly in the Indonesian sort of area. Uh, but there are corals everywhere around the equatorial zone of the planet, even in the colder areas, uh, we, we find corals down in the very, very deep, many thousands of meters deep, uh, also down near the polar region. So we are focusing on, uh, on uh, uh, tropical corals and, and most of those in the, uh, the near surface or photic zone, sort of the 40, 40 plus meters. Um, and we have collected 85 species so far and put them in the biobank uh, facility. So we are on our way to, to getting that full 400. Uh, we've just collected over 22% of the Great Barrier Reef diversity. So yeah, we're, we're certainly making headway. That's really cool. I like to talk sometimes mindset technology and then the impact that we can have on these webinars, but I'm really interested in, uh, I think we all know that there's coral bleaching and the mindset has shifted and people are becoming more and more aware. Like you said, in, in 2020, there was a huge event. Uh, why is collecting coral important? Um, so with every coral bleaching event, what we're effectively losing is the most vulnerable corals and reefs. Uh, and that in turn, uh, is a, a cascade effect in losing biodiversity. Now, corals are the building blocks of coral reefs. That kind of, you know, makes sense. But a lot of people don't understand that, that they are actually the fundamental part of a coral reef ecosystem. And I liken it to a game of Jenga. So if you've got your game of Jenga, your, your tower here, and you can imagine that at the bottom are lots of different coral species. And at the top, you have fish, you have mollusks, you have everything else associated with the coral reef. If you start pulling out coral species from the bottom, it starts getting really, really wobbly. And if you pull out enough, what eventually happens is the tower falls over. So you end up losing that ecosystem function. So biodiversity is extremely important on a coral reef. Um, in addition to that, over 25% of all marine life rely on coral reefs for some part of their life history. So if we lose coral reefs, we lose 25% of marine life in the ocean um, or part thereof, uh, which is really, really scary. And then on top of that, over a billion people worldwide rely on coral reefs every single day for their daily sustenance. So that's going out and catching fish and feeding the family with no refrigerators and electricity and catching additional fish to swap for vegetables and other resources. So if we think that COVID is giving us a, a big social upheaval right now, I can't even try to explain what will happen when we lose coral reefs and what that means to our society. All those people that live in that equatorial zone that rely on corals every single day will be socially displaced. So what do we do with those billion people? Um, so it's a, a very scary proposition here in Australia. You know, we lose coral, we lose reefs, we, we affect tourism. And which is really important, obviously, to us, but it's not, you know, life or death, whereas for that other billion people, it actually is. 
We talk about the world's problems all the time and just thinking about ocean conservation and there's so many aspects to it and there's so much awareness around plastics and pollution and the things that are happening in the ocean. Uh, definitely people depending on fishing for their livelihoods and uh, it, it just it's such an intertwined ecosystem. I'd love to ask you around just your, your personal backgrounds and passions and why you actually chose coral. <laughs> I think corals chose me. Um, my background and passion, uh, I guess I started out as a marine scientist loving sharks. Uh, behind me that way is a, a great white. That's what started everything. Uh, the movie Jaws, believe it or not, uh, inspired me to become a marine scientist and, and actually get in the water. Um, so, yeah. Initially it was sharks, then coral reefs, and then I went to the Antarctic and the Arctic, and then it became the polar regions. And I think I, I really just love oceans and, and life underwater or life in general, um, but particularly the oceans, because it feels like this, you know, other world when you, you immerse yourself, uh, you know, with a scuba set and, and disappear for an hour at a time underwater. Um, it's really, really, very special. I remember when I first started scuba diving, um, you know, on a, on a very regular basis working on a research vessel. Corals were the last thing I'd look at. Um, you know, we weren't worried about coral back then. I was more looking for, you know, the big sharks, the big fish, um, the, the abundance, the diversity. I actually did my PhD looking at the social and economic value of having really healthy dive sites for a tourism industry. Um, and what fell out of that was really interesting in that, you know, people were looking for the big stuff, but they were more interested in a healthy reef environment, the, the abundance and diversity of fish. So knowing that you could go out to a site and just be overwhelmed by, you know, lots of fish, which is really hard to find uh, in a lot of dive sites around the world these days. But more importantly, it was about the corals and knowing that the coral system or foundation was really, really healthy. Um, so my focus has changed from, you know, all these fantastic things swimming around to the colourful, beautiful corals that actually build the Great Barrier Reef and, and coral reefs around the world. And that's because in 2016, I saw firsthand what coral bleaching can actually do to a reef system. And uh, we lost a, a great portion of the reef from Port Douglas North uh, to Cape York, which was considered to be the most pristine part of the entire Great Barrier Reef prior to that time it had really no population centers no big river outflows no nutrient loads from farming um, it, it was the best we had on the great barrier reef and that 2016 event literally cooked the coral there was just a, a big body of hot water that just sat on top of the reef um, and basically uh, you know cooked cooked coral and we lost uh, huge amounts of, of, of coral in terms of abundance and also diversity up there so that was a, a bit of a shock and I realized that this this is real, you know, this is no longer, yeah, we've got time, we can, we can, we can deal with this. We don't, we, we, this is now. Um, so we're having to deal with it straight away, which is why we've come up with the Living Coral Biobank project, because we're trying to put in place an insurance policy or give ourselves an opportunity. If we don't go out there and collect those corals now and hold that living stock, um, we won't have those in the future. So it's our ability to, to have this living stock to assist in reef research and restoration efforts, um, like farming and, and rebuilding reefs, but also looking at how we can actually get corals better adapted to a warming environment. And a lot of scientists are looking at that at the moment. Uh, they're looking at how heat tolerant species actually do this very well. And can we bring that across to the other corals? So yeah, it's a, a very exciting space, but um, our job is to get out there and, and collect what's there. And I kind of liken it to data. Uh, we're just trying to make a backup of what's on the Great Barrier Reef right now. I have so many questions from that. And I'm just thinking uh, from the beginning, uh, you mentioned in 2016, the most pristine part of the reef is now bleached or we've lost it. Is it extinct or is it bleached? Can that come back if there is some sort of way to adjust the DNA or to be able to scientifically help it? Uh, so bleaching is almost like a, a terminal illness. And if the water stays too warm for too long, you end up with coral mortality, which is what happened in the far north. So we actually lost a lot of coral, uh, you know, hundreds and hundreds of square kilometers of coral. Um, the reef replenishes itself through the coral spawning, uh, which is where 
uh, it, it happened two weeks ago. Um, it's where the corals actually release sperm and eggs into the water column and they travel on the next tide and find a new suitable reef to land and hopefully rebuild the next generation of corals. Now that's all well and good if you have a lot of blank real estate, um, but what we tend to see is when you have a coral mortality event, it's almost like a bushfire goes through. And uh, what moves in very, very quickly is large uh, macro algae. And so if the macro algae dominate that landscape, it, it basically means that there's no area or real estate for the new coral to land. So it makes it very, very difficult. And a lot of places around the world where the fishing pressure is very high, um, they will actually take not only predatory fish, but herbivores as well. Uh, and so when you take all those different types of fish out of the system, you lose your ability to get your coral reef back. So they're called tipping points. And uh, when you lose a coral reef to macroalgae, it's almost impossible to get it back. Now that hasn't necessarily happened in the far north. We still have good amounts of herbivores and things are still relatively in check. And given that this spawning event was a very, very strong one, we can only hope that that spawn move further north and will actually start to replenish and rebuild those reefs. But that's a 10 to 15 year process. So that's assuming we have no more crown of thorns, no more cyclones, no more bleaching events, no more water quality issues. So we are really asking a lot of the Great Barrier Reef. Now it has bounced back from you know, numerous events over the, the you know, hundreds of thousands of years that it's been in existence. So it is capable of doing this, but we need to take the pressure off in certain areas to allow it to, to take that breath and, and get back to, to what we consider to be normal. Yeah, incredible. And we have been relying on technology in a number of different areas. I'd love to ask you more about this backup plan and, you know, back, backing up the coral reef. So actually uh, collecting those species, what happens when you collect them? So what we do is we go out there and uh, we're working with Dr. Charlie Varon, who is considered to be the godfather of corals. He went out there and he actually described and named over 20% of the world's coral species has traveled all around the world. And he's one of the only pieces, one of the only people, sorry, that can actually identify corals to a species level underwater. So he comes with us, he identifies a species, we get the coral collector to actually take it. So it's a live uh, collection. They come back to the surface uh, to a holding facility uh, back on land. Uh, we're working with Queensland Museum at the moment who are actually taking tissue samples, genetic material and skeleton, and they're running the full genetic analysis on what the uh, coral colony actually is. And then we take the living fragments and put them in tanks. So uh, over the last 40 or so years, the aquarium industry has really honed down the perfect skill, expertise and equipment uh, needed to actually keep corals alive in, on, on land, so in, in tank systems. And this has been people in, in homes and offices around the world who have just been tinkering and tinkering and managed to solve the problem of this, uh, which is amazing. And here you can see a picture of uh, myself, Dr. Charlie Varon and uh, Lyle Squire, who owns Cairns Marine, which is our industry partner. And this is their facility in Cairns. And we're actually holding uh, the live coral fragments there, and then they're going into those holding tanks. And this system uh, in Cairns, uh, is an industry, uh, I guess, leader. And what they do is collect, hold and distribute corals all around the world every single day of the year. So this is not new technology. And that's the great thing about this project is that we're actually just applying really good science and techniques to make this possible. So the corals come into these tanks, they're uh, placed on a, 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 an acrylic plug with a microchip. Um, and we're actually, uh, we're able to track and trace every part of that coral's history from where it came from on the reef, the water chemistry, the, the depth, the temperature, anything to do with the environmental factors of the reef on that day, and then track it through time, through all the tank parameters and the growth rates. And uh, it's the first time this has ever been done for live coral. So it's very exciting. The other really good thing is that corals are the perfect animal to keep alive in a biobank type uh, system because they can live for hundreds, if not thousands of years. And I remember chatting to one of our sponsors and it was very fortuitous that he watched an episode of Star Trek the night before. And he said, oh, look, I watched this episode and there was this spaceship that had representatives of all the different species from Earth on it. And they had corals there. And he's like, I'm guessing you collected those corals. And I'm like, wow, that is amazing. What a futuristic look at 
a horrible scenario, but um, you know, someone had to collect that living stock uh, initially. So uh, yeah, um, we just flashed up a picture there and that is our uh, designed uh, biobank facility in Port Douglas that we just saw. It's a, a you know, kind of a futuristic style building. Um, and if it goes to construction, it will be the most uh, energy efficient and advanced sustainable building of its kind anywhere on the planet. So what you see there is a, a design mimicked around the mushroom coral. Uh, those finlets on the outside are designed to either reflect or retain heat to harvest water. You can see there, there's got solar panels on the roof. Um, this is hopefully going to be our ultimate biobank facility here in Port Douglas. And we had that land allocated by uh, the Douglas Shire Council. Um, so they're very, very excited about the project. This will not only be the world's only biobank facility, almost similar to the, uh, the seed bank in Svalbard, but it will be an education, tourism and engagement facility. So you'll be able to visit and come and see, and you can see the, the tourists there on the top level looking down at the biosecure uh, biobank uh, facility where we'll actually house the 400 species or so of Great Barrier Reef corals on this side and on the other side is the other 400 or so from the rest of the world. So a big vision, but certainly not impossible. This is, you know, uh, as futuristic as it looks, this is this is possible now. So we're, we're hoping to find our, uh, our angel investors and our sponsors and our supporters out there who are actually willing to make this a reality. Uh, in the meantime, we're out there collecting the corals right now. So um, we will be ready uh, once this facility is good to go to actually just place the corals in that biosecure facility. But of course you don't keep all your eggs in one basket. Uh, and so we are also establishing a global network of public and private aquariums. So just like Uber is the largest transport company in the world and doesn't own a vehicle, we too will lean on the, the world's public and private aquariums of which there are over a million tanks in existence right now. And if you are an owner of one of these tanks, uh, you can actually look after a backup, a live backup fragment of the Great Barrier Reef. Say you don't have a tank, you can still be involved. You can sponsor a coral fragment within our own facility. And you can actually do that right now, which actually helps fund the project. So you will uh, be a, a grandma or a grandpa or a mummy or a daddy to our little coral fragments within our facility. And we'll send you all the growth information and, uh, and updates on that little fragment. So uh, we've also, we've already got lots of people doing that. So we're, we're very, very thankful for those sponsors. Yeah, so you said a couple of things there. One of them was hopefully, it'll get up and running and um, <laughs> like anything dependent on investment, of course, um, it seems like it's such an important thing at the moment. So, um, you know, uh, I know there's a, a seed bank for seeds and whatnot, but uh, we could pretty much house a lot of all of those different species and, and as a backup, um, yeah, why now? Yeah, absolutely. Yes, it does need to happen. Um, and the building, you know, will be the most advanced of its kind anywhere in the world, which is exciting. And the Climate Council is right behind us for that reason. So they're, they're saying, look, if you're going to go out there and, and build this most amazing building, we want to showcase it to, to show engineers and architects exactly what is possible. And the, uh, the design is up for an architectural award at the, uh, the World Architecture Awards uh, in Germany at the moment. Um, but we do need to collect the corals immediately, which is why we're already moving forward on this project. Project. We can't wait for that big facility uh, to be built, even though we, we want it to, um, because the time is now. We will continue to have bleaching events uh, and uh, we will continue to lose species diversity. So we can do this. We're not waiting for any close in uh, technology. Um, it's, it's just a matter of getting out there and making it happen now. Yeah, that's brilliant. And we're really uh, catalyzing that action around it as well and getting out there. And I know you've had so much traction with the media and with people supporting you. So thank you everyone for getting behind the project and everyone that's watching today, please reach out and see how you can help as well. Uh, one of the facts that you did share with me that the coral fragments actually double is it every year when you have collected them? So there is the, the opportunity that we'll, we'll, in the future, we're talking about a future by design, we could actually have a full entire reef backup in private and public aquariums across the world. Yeah, hundred um, percent. I, I keep saying to people, if this was my bank account, I'd be most excited because it is a growing uh, bio bank. And so every six to 12 months, the little fragments will actually double in size. Uh, and so we'll, literally sort of break them in half and re-establish them as two fragments. So yeah, every six to 12 months, the entire collection doubles. Um, so very, very exciting. It means our ability to 
uh, retain that genetic information and diversity is, is very, very high uh, with many, many layers of redundancy and backup. That is very cool. And so we've got a couple of questions. One of them is, um, you know, as a passionate ocean lover, what can individuals do to contribute towards changing the outcome of our reefs? Absolutely, really good question. Um, I would say initially support the Living Coral Biobank project by sponsoring a little fragment. We'd love you to do that. That's something that's very easy to do. And a lot of people struggle with, you know, what can I do personally? Contributing to projects like this and others who do this on a daily basis is, is just crucial. Um, but then it's the big stuff. It's, you know, there's no point putting in all these insurance policies if we're not addressing climate change uh, at, at all. Um, and so it really comes down to politics and, and putting pressure on our politicians to, you know, push them into a, a more climate orientated, uh, I guess, policy framework. Um, and they're, they're just not doing that at the moment. So it's, it's, getting there it's getting there very slowly and i find that you know it's almost too slow and so what we're doing now is focusing on working with uh, the Australian public and the international public, um, and also corporates. Corporates are fantastic at keeping their fingers on the pulse. And what we see within our sponsors is a, a real environmentally focused approach to improving the way people do business and knowing that the end user, the customer, actually is starting to demand uh, products that have, uh, you know, an organic base, if we're talking about food, uh, or really good environmental practices with clothing, um, or, you know, say they, they do something that they at least offset their activities by supporting projects like ours. Um, and I think that's where we're going to see a lot of leadership in this space is, is more through corporate, unfortunately, than, than through government. I think government's playing catch up uh, the whole time. Um, so yeah, we'd love to hear a, a, of a, a big corporate out there who, who'd love to be part of this project and, and have their, you know, brand associated with real reef action. And that's what this is. It's, it's getting out there, getting out hands dirty and just making this happen. I'm going to ask you about some more of the expeditions at the end so we could finish on that really a positive high note of what it's like to get out there and maybe even visit Antarctica as well as the, the reef because I know that you're a professional explorer and that's very exciting. Uh, we've got another couple of questions. Uh, Steve has uh, mentioned he's excited to see the work is being done to save the genetic diversity of corals, but he's worried that these biobanks will become the museums of the future of what once lived. Uh, what work is being done to restore, protect coral that currently exists? Yep, really good question. Um, we certainly don't want to take our eyes off the prize of, you know, the natural system. That's not what this is about. This is supposed to be a complementary effort to just create that backup of what's out there right now, because we are losing what's out there. So unless we do this, we won't have that in the future. Um, there are also other reef research and restoration efforts going on. Um, and these are quite promising, but they focus on very few species. Only one to three different species are actually being researched for how they can uh, you know, put up with these heat stress events. Um, and then there's reef restoration efforts, which is where we start rebuilding reefs, which is only good on a scale of about 10 to 100 to perhaps even 1,000 square metres. So it's really local stuff. It's, you know, looking after tourism sites, for instance. So it's not going to save the Great Barrier Reef. Um, so our project kind of puts in place this insurance policy or buys us a little bit of time. So when that technology improves, we have that living stock ready to go. So yeah, it's, um, I certainly don't want the biobank to be a, a living museum. That's, that's not the intention here. It, it's a complementary approach to a, a multi uh, faceted uh, way of solving this problem with the, 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 the highest tier of that addressing climate change. As a follow on to that, Marine has asked, do you release the corals to the oceans once they've multiplied in the bank? Um, that's the intention to have the, the living stock available to uh, support reef restoration and, uh, and, and coral farming efforts. Um, right now, we're just in the process of collecting and holding and making sure that we get that collection sorted. Um, but in the future, yes, that's, that's the, uh, uh, one of the, the intentions of the biobank initially. All right, now we've got a, a more scientific question for you from Louis. Are corals dual symbiotic hosts, algae and fungi, and akin to plants, are phosphate levels in the water a high driver, bleaching from the coral, reducing the need to host the symbionics? symbionics. 
Yep, they have multiple symbiotic partners, uh, bacteria and algae. Um, and it's a really interesting relationship and we, we're only just starting to understand how that works exactly. Um, you know, prior to 2016, I think that was more novelty than anything, working out that, that beautiful relationship that allows corals to grow so quickly and, and harness you know, the, uh, the power of algae to, to create that coral skeleton, which builds the framework of the entire Great Barrier Reef. Um, so yeah, it's a beautiful little relationship and we're just starting to unlock the code on, on how that works because it's that relationship that's breaking down in the bleaching events. Um, if we're talking about phosphates and nutrient levels, look, it's all cumulative. Everything out there that it has a negative impact on, uh, I guess, the health and, and resilience of corals is an issue. So, you know, it, it's multiple, multiple things that we're looking at, but unless we're starting to really understand the bleaching, which is the biggest single driver of, of coral mortality, um, we're, we're not gonna solve that problem. But you're right, we do need to address every part of the, 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 uh, the impact. And so in, in raising funds for the project, I know that you had a lot of, success with uh being on australian story and um and then other avenues what's working at the moment and how are you going with raising funds for the project yep um you're right uh, abc australian story ran an episode on uh the life and career of dr charlie veron our, uh, our research partner um and part of that was the biobank uh and the response from the australian public or people who viewed that was uh, over two hundred thousand dollars raised in just over two weeks that has now allowed us to build our own internal facilities. Our first one is currently being built. That's able to hold 8,000 live fragments. And we're talking to Cairns Aquarium at the moment about uh, installing a, another facility capable of holding 12,000 live coral fragments. So we are well underway to uh, making sure that the corals are safe and sound once they get back to land. We're now looking for support to actually go out and collect the coral. So funding expeditions to go out and, and actually uh, collect the full biodiversity of corals is what we're chasing now. As I said, we'd love a big corporate sponsor. We'd love a, a, a big philanthropist who just loves this project and the oceans to get behind us and go, yep, let's make this happen. It's just too important not to, not to uh, pursue. Um, but in addition to that, what's actually keeping us afloat is, you know, viewers, it's, it's the general public who are just donating out of their pockets on a monthly basis saying, you guys are doing a great job, um, make, this, make this possible for us and our children. And, you know, I've got a little two-year-old uh, daughter and, you know, she's the best reference point for, for all of this because I keep saying, oh, she'll be 10 in eight years, you know, will we be able to go out to our favourite spots on the Great Barrier Reef and actually show her you know, what a reef should look like. And, and I worry about the, the possibility of that. So um, yeah, this is all about future-proofing our ability to, uh, to have our Great Barrier Reef. So in an, in an ideal world, what does that future look like? So we're talking about a future by design, what's the impact that we can have? And let's say in 10 years time, you take your daughter out to the reef, what's happened? Ah, well, what's happened? Well, uh, the project has been a complete success and we have all species uh, now uh, safe and sound in our land-based facilities and fully backed up in public and private aquariums around the world. So we know that we have that insurance policy in place. I think in, in 10 or so years, what really needs to happen is some serious climate uh, policy from, from governments all over the world. Um, you know, we keep on referring to 2050 plans and, and, and things like that. I think it's just too far ahead. We're, we're just looking too far. And if we haven't succeeded by 2050, I really worry that we've lost the Great Barrier Reef as we know it. There'll always be something out there. There'll always be uh, a you know, a handful of coral species that are able to withstand these heat stress moments, but it won't be the full biodiversity that we know and love, uh, which is our Great Barrier Reef right now. So um, I really think we, we desperately need to, you know, just step up to the plate now and, and, and address climate change as our single biggest issue, not just for coral reefs, but for, uh, you know, life on earth. Um, you know, we're, we're getting continual warnings. I mean, when Sir David Attenborough stands up and says, look, guys, you, you've got to listen. Um, you know, he's seen it all. He's, he's out there. And uh, uh, I think, yeah, it's, it's time. I think we're, we're just ignoring it just that little bit too much. And every time we keep continually getting these warnings, whether it be uh, polar ice caps melting, whether it be, you know, coral bleaching, whether it be extreme bushfires in the 1920s summer, you know, these are all 
little hints that we're, we're pushing things too far. So we're, we've got to pull it back. And the most simple thing you can do is plant trees. You know, you can, you can plant trees, it sequesters carbon, it becomes habitat for species on land, uh, filters the, the soil and, and, you know, improves the entire system. Um, I know when I fly back into Melbourne, my original hometown, you know, you can barely see a tree on your, on your way in there and, and you just can't remove that amount of, uh, I guess, vegetation without having an impact. And, and we certainly have, we've, we've altered the climate locally and regionally and globally. I learned recently that we used to have seven trillion trees on the planet. Now we've just got over three trillion trees and we're a net deficit of about 10 billion per year. And I know that there's a lot of awareness around it and there's a lot happening in this space. Are you positive and confident with the amount of attention and conversations that are happening at the moment that in 10 years time that we will actually be able to preserve what we have at the moment in biodiversity? I think there's enough good people out there, enough good organisations and enough big corporates and philanthropists that are willing to make this happen, that are pushing every single day uh, and, and, you know, driving this change. I think the governments really need to, to step up. I mean, it's, it's, it's almost embarrassing in Australia to, to see how inadequate we are at addressing climate and how we continually keep supporting, you know, fossil fuel industries and, and giving them, you know, huge tax breaks and, and all kinds of incentives to, to continue what they're doing and opening new coal mines. I mean, it's old technology. We have the ability to move from this space. And I remember someone saying, we didn't come out of the, uh, the uh, stone age because we ran out of rocks and uh, it couldn't be more true. We just need to take this on and, and, and make it happen. Um, we can improve and we should. Absolutely. We've got a lot of questions. I know it's such an important topic and I know we uh, definitely always uh, get people really interested. And we've got a few really long ones here. So I'm going to attempt to read one around uh, the Australia having robust biosecurity laws when it comes to ocean conservation and wildlife protections. Yeah. And uh, Sion is asking, has any work been done to look at the current restrictions around implications around animals being taken from captivity back into the wild? And our present in the reef keeping hobby, there is only a small percentage of corals being kept in captivity, uh, focused on appearance, uh, mostly with private tanks. Uh, it's quite a long question, so I'll skip a little bit there. But um, um, do you see hope that it'll move to uh, more endangered fish species, other parts of the reef ecosystem as well? Yeah, absolutely. Really good question. Um, you're right, the biosecurity measures are very high for trying to put corals from tanks back into the wild, and rightly so. Um, and it's it's not really on the table just yet. Um, so we are breaking new ground by doing this. Um, to give you some sort of perspective, five years ago, they never would have considered reef restoration. So they, they never would have considered putting uh, structures out on the reef to replanting corals to, to anything that we're doing today. But here we are five years later and we're doing it on a grand scale. So we know this is coming. We know things will improve and we will be at the forefront of this, uh, working with government and, and a policy on how to uh, make sure that this is done to the highest possible level. Because the last thing you want to do is introduce a cane toad to the Great Barrier Reef, for instance. So really, really good question. And uh, we are right on the ball on that. Um, tanks at the moment look after a few species worldwide. You are absolutely correct. Uh, the aquarium industry relies on 20 to 30 ornamental type species. Um, and that's what drives that industry. Um, we are using the industry to actually go out there and collect all the species of coral and have them looked after in tanks around the world. So we're kind of creating this new niche market or, uh, you know, tanks with purpose kind of thing. Um, so we know that the people out there are leading the space on how to look after and keep corals alive. In fact, they're well ahead of the scientists on this. Um, so we are, are very confident that we will be able to look after the full uh, species diversity of at least Great Barrier Reef coral species. Um, and I'm just looking at your uh, question. Um, do you see? Yeah, I, I think hobbyists are going to become increasingly more important as time goes on um, because we have all those tanks already set up. So uh, if you're a high operating hobbyist or home uh, or public tank owner, um, then we are certainly looking to you to look after backup fragments. 
so let's talk about some of the fun expeditions now. Uh, I know you had a, a road to new, had a whole heap of scientists and people go out and do one of the, the world's biggest research events recently. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, that's how we launched Great Barrier Reef Legacy, actually. Uh, we um, ran a, uh, a, the biggest privately funded collaborative research, education, and communication uh, expedition on the Great Barrier Reef back in 2017. And that was to go up into the far northern section of the Great Barrier Reef and really have a look at what had happened to the corals to provide an overall reef health assessment, but to also see which corals had died and which ones had survived. So we provided free access to the world's best researchers in the, the coral reef space, to educators and to communicators. So we were delivering content on a daily basis to a global audience. Uh, it was extremely exciting uh, to, to get that amount of people together uh, on the one boat um, and have all those different, uh, I guess, research interests and, and levels of expertise looking at the same reef on the same day. So that generally just doesn't happen. Um, but we were a little, I guess, shocked by what we saw. We were looking at the impact of that 2016 bleaching event and uh, it was quite devastating up in the far north. It, it kind of kind of looked like a big bushfire had been through. So uh, a lot of the reef was dead and blackened and, and covered in algae. Uh, we still found really good areas, uh, which was very hopeful. And they're the ones that will actually reseed and replenish uh, the coral reefs of that region. So it's good to know that, you know, it is improving at the moment. We are on an up, um, but you never know when the next bleaching event's coming. And, and this summer certainly looks to be a warm one. So um, yeah, it was a great expedition. It was funded by philanthropy, by the Morris Foundation. Um, they then backed us again in 2017 and we ran another major expedition. And then we were donated a, a 56 foot carbon fiber cruising racing yacht from the Sydney to Hobart fleet by uh, Sir David uh, Forbes, um, who is a, a, an Olympian for Australia and won gold in the 1972 Munich Olympics for sailing. And he contacted us and said, look, you guys are doing great things. The ocean has been good to me. Can I be good to the ocean and give you my boat? And so we were donated this beautiful, beautiful yacht, which we brought up from Sydney and we just took it out on the recent, recent uh, spawning event. So um, yeah, we now have uh, three boats within our fleet. Uh, which is just fantastic, which means we can continue expeditions and operate under our own steam and uh, well, not steam, we're, we're operating under wind power, which is just fantastic. It's a, it's a beautiful yacht that uses very, very little, uh, you know, diesel fuel because we just have beautiful big sails so we can, we can travel for free and, uh, and energy free as well. That's cool. Do you think the future of tourism to the reef in the future will always have a an element of education and impact around it and how long do you think it does consider conservation of the reef? Look tourism is the number one reason that we will save the Great Barrier Reef. I am absolutely confident of that. Um, that was part of my PhD and I've worked within and, and close to the tourism industry for, for near on 20 years now, it's how the general public see the Great Barrier Reef. Um, and when you see an environment as beautiful and special as the Great Barrier Reef, you make a connection and you want to do something. And that's how we connect with you know, any environment on earth. Um, so it's also the biggest economic driver uh, and that's what governments look at. That's what uh, you know, people talk about is, is dollar figures. Um, and it's a, a $56 billion industry. Um, so it's extremely important uh, that we have strong continued tourism on the Great Barrier Reef. If people are continuing to have great experiences, if they're coming from all over the globe to see the Great Barrier Reef, we know that we're doing a good job. When they stop coming because they stop like what they see, um, we know that we've lost the, the game in a way. And I think that's really, really important. You wouldn't want to go to, you know, the pyramids, for instance, and, and realize that it's just a pile of rubble now and, and you've missed the boat. Um, so yeah, tourism is really, really important for the Great Barrier Reef. And uh, we need to make sure that um, we do everything we can to support the tourism industry to make sure that all these visitors from all around the world continue to have the most amazing experiences because it means we're, we've done the job right. In perspective, the dollars that you mentioned there with the size of the industry compared to what you would need to actually collect the rest of the species of the coral and be able to create the biobank there at Port Douglas, which was like really futuristic and very cool and quite achievable. It seems like such an insignificant amount of money for something that's so important. 
Yeah, I agree. I agree. Absolutely. Um, and you know, it's, it's, we're not asking the tourism industry to, to put up the funds for this. Um, uh, you know, they are doing it tougher than ever with COVID and, you know, they get very little support from the government in terms of their operations. They run, you know, multi-million dollar vessels every single day. Um, but you're right, in perspective of what we're actually trying to do and what we're trying to create for regional Queensland and Australia uh, uh, by having this world-class tourism uh, facility, an education facility, a research facility, uh, a community accessible uh, biobank. It's, it's extremely important. If you've ever been to the UK, for instance, and visited the Eden Project, you will know what I'm talking about. You know, those places change lives. I, I remember visiting the Eden Project and just going, wow, this, this is amazing. Like, I want to be part of this now. Um, and that's what we want for the biobank facility and the project, not just to go out there and conserve corals, but be this, you know, ultimate education, uh, interpretive, immersive experience that allows people to connect with coral reefs like never before, and then know and understand how they can have a positive impact. And I'm, I'm guessing that you're going to get kids involved as well. And what's typically <laughs> their reaction when they learn about coral? Uh, I think going out and visiting schools and, and doing, you know, webinars like this with kids is probably my favourite thing on the planet, uh, especially primary school. They are just so excited and enthusiastic and motivated about anything to do with the ocean. Um, they are so well versed. The teachers are doing a fantastic job. Yeah, we want this to be, uh, you know, uh, a one stop shop for anyone coming to this region to, to bring your kids and and have them just have the best day, like a, a totally immersive uh, almost like a, if you've ever been to Mona Museum, if you've ever been to Science Works in Victoria, um, if you've ever been to, you know, like a sea world, so it'll have tanks, it'll have, you know, displays, it'll have interactive things that you can do. It'll just be, you know, kids screaming and running around having a great time is what I'd love to see. Um, they really are the future. Um, we, we do need to prepare them and, and have something good for them to take on. And it's up to us to make sure that that is, you know, really high quality uh, in terms of a, an environment that they can, you know, really work with uh, before it's actually gone too far, but also that education and those resources that they need to just pick up the baton and just run with it. Um, but, uh, you know, having visited so many schools, I have a huge faith and, uh, and uh, knowledge that the kids are going to do a fantastic job. They really, they're on the ball. That's a great segue into the most important question of the day on a future by design is it's the year 2041. You've just woken up and based on our conversation, what does the world look like? Wow, the world is the most beautiful place. Uh, the, uh, every, every country on earth is working as one big team. We've replanted a, a massive percentage of our forests. I think that's really important that we, you know, we're continually taking, but we need to start giving back. Um, the, the reef is healthy. Uh, our climate is stable. We have the technology now. We've somehow pulled the carbon out of the atmosphere and we're holding it at, at good levels in addition to the trees, which do that naturally. Um, I do think that technology is going to play a huge role here. Um, I really hope that, you know, it's just safe to go outside. It's not blistering hot and we won't need ridiculous levels of sunscreen to, uh, to actually step out in the sun. I know that it's getting pretty warm up here in North Queensland at the moment. So, um, yeah, look, 2041, um, I just sincerely hope and pray that uh, we've got it sorted because if we haven't got it sorted by 2041, we're in, we're in deep trouble. Um, but I'll end on a high note. It is beautiful outside. Um, there are animals everywhere. The, the birds are chirping. Um, we've done it. We've done a good job. Every, everything has succeeded. We talk about that we really are living in the most amazing time to be alive. And you think, if you think about the biodiversity that we actually have now on the planet and the ability to access resources and to be able to save them and do something now that's going to really secure that future and secure the future of biodiversity, I think um, that's what inspires me the most. And when we talk about it, it really is the time is now. It's not in five years or 10 years and we've also spoken about, you know, how you look around and you think someone else has got this. And we are the generations. We're the people that have got this and we need to get this. And um, like you say, with the kids, they're so excited about it. So let's create that future that they are going to inherit and be able to really carry on and make it even better. 
Absolutely. Yeah. And look, you know, the interesting thing about the Biobank project is we have a window of opportunity now. Um, places like Florida, for instance, they're actually having to do a biobank style project because they've lost corals initially through bleaching and then a coral disease that's come through. So they're collecting any live colony, putting them in tanks, bathtubs, swimming pools, whatever they can just to keep them alive. So this is not a, you know, a chicken little, hey, the, the sky's falling potentially. No, it's happening somewhere else in the world right now. So this is our opportunity. This is our time right now to go and get what's on the Great Barrier Reef and back it up. Uh, so we have that for future generations and, and research and restoration efforts. Brilliant. So on that note, how can people get in touch with you and be able to support the projects? Great. You can jump on uh, the website uh, or Facebook, Great Barrier Reef Legacy. So you can just search for that. Um, jump on the Coral Biobank website. Become a sponsor, please. Sponsor a little coral fragment. Um, and if you have a tank like our uh, some of our listeners do, uh, when our fragments become available, please put your hand up to host one. We'd love to have you look after uh, a little piece of the Great Barrier Reef for us. Um, but yeah, just thank you. Keep doing everything that you're doing. If you're watching this webinar, chances are you're very much on the ball and already on your way to doing something very, very positive today. That's so fantastic. And I know since we've met, I've been just even more and more keen to get involved and to be able to support the project. So we will be doing that with Wavia and um, and any other future projects that you're doing. I know that, um, you know, if you're doing an expedition, there'd be a lot of people that would be very keen to come along and to be able to join and experience the Great Barrier Reef through your eyes as well. So uh, let's all rally behind getting this biobank up and running and being able to go and celebrate the grand opening. Thank you so much, Lisa, and thank you everyone for watching today. Great. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for joining us on A Future by Design. Let's design the future that we want to live in in the next 10 years together. We will see you all again shortly. Thank you, Dean, so much. Thank you. Have a great day.